In this morning session, we'll explore the issue of metro regions in federal countries. To tell us more about the intergovernmental issues, processes, and modalities in a federal setup, uh, Mr. Marco Costa from the Office of Planning and Institutional Coordination, Government of Brazil, and Professor Phil Harrison, Professor of Development Planning from the Wits University in Johannesburg. Patrick Heller would be chairing this session. Patrick is a professor of sociology at the Brown University. He's currently a research fellow at the Center for Policy Research, Delhi. The panelists on this, uh, in this session are Kalpana Sharma, who's an independent journalist and columnist with The Hindu. We have Mr. A. Ravindra, who's the urban advisor, government of Karnataka, and Darshani Mahadevya, who's, the fac who's a faculty member in the School of Planning and Public Policy, SEPT University. I ask Marco to please make his presentation. Oops. <laughs> yeah, that's it. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, namaste, as I should say. <laughs> it's a pleasure to be here. And my purpose is presenting uh, Brazilian experience in metropolitan region management and governance. Uh, it's not bringing the best practices or things like that. We, we do know it's not the, the case. It's rather bringing our experience, our challenges, difficulties, and specifically in this session, uh, sharing uh, a federative perspective on governance experience. Uh, well, you know where Brazil is, I suppose. This blue point, I, this blue point is Brasilia. It's not Buenos Aires. Brazilian federal structure is a federative country. Fe our federal structure have the union, 27 states, and 5,569 5, municipalities. Uh, all our territory is divided in municipalities. There is no, no gap, no empty space. Uh, every corner belongs to a, a municipality. Uh, it, it, well, you know, it's a huge country, 8.5 million square kilometers. Our population in the last census, 2010, is 190. And our degree of urbanization is 88.4. It's definitely a urbanized country. Our GDP uh, is 2.2 US dollars. And our per capita is about eleven and a half dollars. Each each of these levels in our federation has, uh, of course, the executive head, the president, governor in the case of states, and the mayors. And of course, there are also the legislative chairmen and and so on. They are all elected, direct elections, uh, the three levels. We used to say we are the biggest democracy in the world uh, because of the direct elections. Uh, the union, uh, the president and the governor are elected for a four years mandate. He can be re-elected once. And uh, 2010, it, it was our last uh, presidential and uh, state government election. And uh, average four years, uh, last year, 2012, we had our municipality elections. So it's not matched, which may be an uh, advantage and also a problem. Uh, how to deal with the horizontal and vertical relations in a federative country when you don't have these elections matched. Uh, in this map you have, uh, I don't know, yeah, it's quite clear. Uh, the annual growth of population between 2000 and 2010. Uh, the blue municipalities uh, had decrease of population. Uh, the yellow ones between 0 to 2.5 per year. Uh, and the orange and, and red are really the municipalities that experienced a big growth. Uh, as you can see, just in our Amazon region, you have uh, more municipalities growing over the average. In southeast and in the south, uh, our population is quite stabilized. 
Uh, our municipalities has a long history due to our Portuguese influence. Uh, since the colonial times, we have municipalities. Uh, it was just 177 uh, when the independence came. And then today, uh, we see clearly two periods of a huge increment of municipalities. In the 46 to 66, there was a, a municipalism movement and more than 2,000 were created in these years. And after the, the federal constitution, the new federal constitution of 88, after the dictatorship, uh, we also experiment uh, uh, an increment, uh, a huge uh, increment of municipalities in Brazil. Well, just some figures to understand, uh, they, are, they will be important in the end. Uh, I said we have $2.2 trillion as GDP. The union budget this year is $1.2 trillion. Um, Brazilians, uh, a quarter of Brazilian GDP uh, is this, I, I, I guess it's 1.2 trillion reais. Uh, a quarter of Brazilian GDP is a public budget, just the union. Uh, 120 billion is discretionary expenses. The other 88.4 are compulsory expenses. The government uh, can change it, are legal and constitutional transferences. And uh, this 120 billion is expanded in healthcare mainly. Uh, the acceleration growth program, which is a program created in 2007, and I'll talk about it later. Education and Brazil without poverty. It's a huge social program uh, since 2003, 2004. Uh, the, the PAC, the, this acceleration growth program, is expanded 26 billion this year. Transport and logistics, 9.5 billion. Housing, 6.9 billion. And World Cup and Olympics, 1 billion. Uh, this is our structure, legally speaking. Uh, we have some administrative matters that belongs just to the union. Uh, international relations, national defense, so on. Uh, we have private competences in legislative uh, area. All civil, criminal, uh, procedural, electoral laws are federal and belongs to the union. You, you, don't, have, you, don't, you don't have this case of uh, someone commits a crime in a state, cross the border, uh, is free to go. Uh, it's federal, the union. Uh, we have some concurrent legislative competences shared by the union and the states. And here, uh, the, the matter of urbanism and metropolitan governance is included. And we have a long list of common and horizontal administrative laws and uh, issues. Uh, there is no subordination. It's quite uh, Quite, in, quite a mess, <laughs> I have to say. Uh, justice is always being asked to uh, respond. Uh, each level in, the, in, in our federal structure must respond to a certain question, to a certain activity. Uh, and everything is there, public health, social security, education, environmental, uh, everything is in this common and horizontal competences. Uh, other entities uh, responsible is expressed in the federal constitution. The states, after, uh, especially after 1988, they define by complementary laws the metropolitan regions, the micro regions, uh, and urban ag agglomerations. Uh, they can create and establish how they will be managed. Uh, and maybe, uh, possibly based on what we call the public functions of common interest. Uh, and then, and municipalities have supplement federal and state laws, 
organize and provide local public services, including public transport, uh, education, the, especially the, the, the first nine years, belongs to the municipalities, public health, although there is a national system, uh, and promoting territorial planning by land use and subdivision control. It belongs to the municipalities. So you, you have 5,569 municipalities controlling land use and subdivision, uh, land subdivision itself. Uh, it's a lot of people. <laughs> Well, uh, the metro region's genesis, w when it began. Uh, our first metropolitan regions were established before 1988, in 1973 and 74, by the federal government during the dictatorship regime, the military regime. Uh, it was a time, uh, the 70s, of economic growth. There was a lot of easy money uh, in the markets. Uh, the government contract a big debt that became a problem years later. Uh, politically, we had a dictatorship, no social participation at all. Uh, uh, urbanization process going on, uh, completely different from the, the, the information I gave you in the last census. Uh, and a centralized public management. Uh, we call it the technocracy era. Uh, and so the, the metropolitan regions were created in, in these times. Uh, you can imagine how people react uh, in a bad humor when you're talking about metropolitan regions. It is a kind of connected to dictatorship and technocracy. Uh, well, there were created nine metropolitan regions uh, São Paulo, Belo Horizonte, Curitiba, uh, the major cities still in the country. Uh, the, the law defined uh, what uh, and on which were the public functions of common interest, uh, established some facilities for these regions to get financing, especially in economic and social infrastructure. And there was a, a linkage between this metropolitan region creating a strategy and the second national development plan. So creating the metropolitan regions in Brazil in the 70s was kind of a strategy to push the economy forward uh, and, and thinking in a regional perspective. Uh, the law bring a institutional design that should be replied in every state, the nine states that had metropolitan regions. There is a Del deliberative council uh, appointed by the state governor, uh, an advisory council, and a fund was, was thinking to, to carry on the problems and finance the, the, the infrastructure. Uh, it worked in some, in some cases. It was, uh, although, of course, technocratic and non-participatory process, uh, it worked, as we'll see later. Uh, after 90, 1988, the new federal constitution did a, a, a shift in these competences. The states are, are now responsible for creating and managing our metropolitan regions. Uh, it is quite a shift. Uh, as we see, we have no criteria for creating metropolitan regions. And there is a kind of dislocation between the social process, the economic process that configures a social spatial metropolitan region and the, the metropolitan region itself, uh, legally speaking. Uh, we had uh, a recession during the 80s and the 90s. Uh, it was not good, economically speaking. Uh, it won, uh, this is one of the reasons the dictatorship uh, came to an end, uh, of course. They experiment huge problems, increasing social demands, and had no financing conditions to carry on the, the old model, the centralized model. 
Uh, we have the consolidation of democracy with presidential elections in 1989, uh, an increase, an uh, eager of social participation, uh, and decentralizing uh, the public management. Uh, centralization was equal dictatorship, technocracy. Decentralization, it's democracy, and it's, it's, it's like uh, after some years we, we understand it's not quite this way, <laughs> not necessary. But in the in the in the eighties and the early nineties, that was uh, that was everybody was thinking about decentralization is equal democracy. Uh, after 88, we have, uh, this is a 2012 balance because it's moving on. We have news every month. We have 55 metropolitan regions in Brazil, which makes no sense at all. And three integrated development regions. This integrated development regions is when we have a metropolitan regions which some municipalities belongs to more than one state. You have two or more state uh, municipalities participating in the metropolitan region. We have an integrated development region. Uh, I guess it's a bit like Delhi. Uh, I don't know if the comparison works. Uh, but our statistical and geographic institution that carries on this, the census and our Brazilian data E-B-G-E, in these four letters, recognize just 12 metropolis in Brazil. Which means, if I look uh, in terms of social economical process, I may say there are 12 metropolis in Brazil. Those nine from the 70s and three more. But Actually, legally, 55 metropolitan regions exist. Uh, they also re recognize that there is a big national metropolis, Sao Paulo, of course, two national metropolis, Rio de Janeiro and Brasilia, the capital, and nine metrop uh, metropolitan spaces. These metropolitan spaces are not looking forward to, to be in a of course they want to, but they are not seeking a better position in the global system, the global city system. Uh, maybe Sao Paulo, of course, and Rio too, but Brasilia and the other nine, not really. Uh, I, know, I know Curitiba is a, a good example for a lot of things, and uh, they sell themselves very well, <laughs> but they don't seek to be a, a, a global city exactly. Well, we have the, here uh, uh, a map, and in your left you have the 55 metropolitan regions existing in 2012, and uh, on the right, the 12 metropolis. Uh, as you can see, uh, it's completely different, and there are some strange things like this. Uh, in the left, we have the state of Roraima in the north region. And this is a, a satellite image. Uh, you see this like a fish. Uh, this is the ur urba urbanized area. Uh, the rest is the rainforest. And it is a metropolitan region of 12,000 people. Uh, as strange as it gets. On the other side, we have Sao Paulo. 39 municipalities, 19.5 uh, million people, uh, GDP 412 billion in 2010, uh, of course, uh, a minor area. This both are, are metropolitan regions regarding the law, uh, which is quite strange. Well, we, ha we, ha we have some figures here. Uh, these 12 metropolis are responsible for 45% of our GDP. Uh, it's huge. Uh, if you see in the map uh, how little they are, uh, small areas in a big country, 
but they respond for almost half of our GDP. Well, uh, we already have Sao Paulo. This is the perimeter of the official metropolitan region. This is what IBGE recognizes as a metropolis, considering some, some economic and social data. And here we have a, a comparison, just, just to know that in that map, comparing the 55 and the 20, uh, maybe the same region is there. But the, mun the munici municipalities are not the same. Like Manaus. Manaus is that green, that green one in the north of Brazil. Uh, for the IBGE, Manaus is a city region. Finally, I found one, Philip, a city region. <laughs> Manaus is a city region. There is just one municipality. If you look, uh, conurbation, uh, economic and social uh, data, just Manaus. But the metropolitan region of Manaus uh, have like five municipalities. Some of them you have to, to go by boat in five, six hours to get there. There is no conur conurbanized areas and things like that. Uh, so uh, what the state government did uh, creating these metropolitan regions was making a bit of a mess and confusing us. Uh, it's a huge uh, distance between what is socially and economically a, a, a metropolis and what is in Brazil a metropolitan region. Now I brought to you some figures about our 12 uh, most important metropolitan regions, including Brasilia, which is not a metropolitan region, is a, uh, a RIGI, a development integrated area because it, it, it takes part of the federal district, Brasilia, part of some municipalities from Goiás, state of Goiás, and part from the state of Minas Gerais. So uh, the metropolitan area of Brasilia takes uh, take municipalities from three different states. Uh, if you look to this data, the numbers are not so bad, I must say. I was hoping to console uh, Mr. Sivarama Krishna, but the numbers are, are, are quite good. Uh, electric, uh, electric energy disponibility is almost 100%. Uh, general water supply in Brazil, 82.9. In the metropolitan regions, 91.2. Uh, here the problems are in the north region, Belém and Manaus. Of course, uh, they are different cities because the Amazon uh, basin, it, it's completely a different world, uh, even for us uh, uh, in Brazil. We don't, we don't understand exactly how, th how things work in the north, because it's completely different. Ne the network is, is made by rivers, uh, creeks, uh, the cities, the cities, the urban network is completely different. And of course they have difference in the, in the matters of supply, uh, and waste collection, solid waste collection. The data on solid waste collection for the metropolitan regions goes to 97.5. Uh, the house, houses with bathrooms or toilets goes to 99.7 in metropolitan regions. Uh, bathrooms connected to the sewage or pluvial system, 74.2. Uh, again, Manaus, Belém, and the cities in the northeast uh, brings the, the worst data. Uh, and the population of our metropolitan region goes to 65. It's a third of our national population. And the degree of urbanization in the metro regions go to 97.6. Uh, so it's an urbanized world. Uh, if you if you look, uh, it's the same map uh, I showed you before, 
but point in the 12 metropolitan regions uh, we, we have. So you see, uh, Manaus is the one who is growing uh, more rapidly. The others, uh, not really. Uh, a bit Brasilia area, but uh, Porto Alegre in the south is experimenting the de decrease of population and so on. Uh, we, are, we are carrying on a project at my institution and we are analyzing uh, the institutional arrangements in, this, in 15 metropolitan regions in Brazil, of course the most important ones, the nine and five more, uh, six more. Uh, some results we're getting, 46% uh, of them, these are, these are the most important metropolitan regions. São Paulo, Rio de Janeiro, Curitiba, Belo Horizonte, Brasília. 46% uh, have a specific management institutions. Less than half really have someone to respond to the metropolitan questions. 56% have specific funds for metropolitan development, but just 33% of them are actives. Actives, uh, very largely speaking, uh, not really active, but exist and have some money. And 73% have deliberative councils, but just 30% of them allow civil, civil participation on their, uh, it's almost non-recent registration of its activities. Uh, I was a former council in Belo Horizonte metropolitan region. Here we have uh, some maps showing you how uh, some public functions are expressed in territorial basis when, when it comes to who is responsible for management in these public functions. In case of health, here is Sao Paulo. Uh, as you can see, we have three different regional uh, directorships, something like this. Uh, so you don't have one uh, institution responding for the education in the metropolitan region. Uh, in this case, you have three. In education in Sao Paulo, you have, it's a patchwork, uh, a lot of colors. Uh, in sanitation, we, uh, also we have, se I guess, seven different institutions responding uh, for water and sewage. Uh, in Rio, the same. Uh, in health, we have four, five different uh, institutions. Uh, in education, uh, a patchwork. Uh, and this, these are the two biggest cities in Brazil. Uh, these two cities, we, we can call them mega cities. Um, and do you remember uh, when I showed you the, the public budget? Uh, $120 billion for discretionary expenses from the federal government. Uh, this is the whole budget for the state of Sao Paulo, city of Sao Paulo, state of Rio, and city of Rio. Uh, which means they don't have money uh, to invest, to carry on with our infrastructure needs. So analyzing the, cur the current situation, uh, there was an institutional metropolization, we call that institutional metropolization process partially reflecting Brazilian urban network, uh, still concentrated, far from polycentric, uh, but in process of interiorization. Uh, this came with or led to uh, an institutional fragmentation. Metropolitan management per se became more fragmented, especially if you consider uh, case by case each public function of common interest. Uh, there was a weakening of metropolitan management uh, after 88. So this shift passing from federal government to state government produced a weakening process in metropolitan management, at least in the first, uh, in the first years. Uh, 11 states, we have 27, 11 do not define what is a public function of common interest. Uh, they don't have criteria for that. Only 10 states have, uh, at least as an institu institutional design, a system of metropolitan management. An agency, a council, 
a fund. Uh, but 16 state laws provide for the creation of metropolitan councils. Since participation is a big issue, uh, they do their best to create these councils. But I must say, the, the, these councils, unfortunately, are leading to nowhere. Uh, I was a councillor for two years in Belo Horizonte metropolitan region. It's uh, in law a, a deliberative council, which means we had to, to have uh, some power. But in two years of work, uh, we deliberate nothing, which is a quite frustrating experience. Uh, it just nine uh, provides for the creation of metropolitan funds. So financing I is a big issue. Outcomes from the statute of the city uh, are municipality, uh, municipally restricted uh, and the metropolitan regions remain open. Uh, we have this statute of the city. Uh, it's linked to the right of the city concept, which is great. And we have uh, a couple of good experiences with master plans, and participatory democracy uh, in urban planning. Uh, we have quite a good experience in this area. But since the municipalities are, uh, and there is a, uh, a debate upon these questions, since the municipality is entitled to management, land use, and land subdivision, uh, what can the state government do? Uh, well, uh, uh, there is uh, in our Congress uh, a project, a law project, a project of law, uh, to create the statute of the metropolis. Uh, since we realized the, the statute of the city becomes a, a, a reference, uh, I, I have to say a, a road reference, uh, and the problems we, we experience in metropolitan governance, they're trying to, to write a law on uh, kind of a mirror law to the status of the metropolis. Well, financing the metropolitan region development, uh, especially social and urban infrastructure, became an important challenge. And it's important to, to ask uh, how and who will finance metropolitan region uh, development. Well, uh, if you look the numbers, the, the public budget numbers, who is financing metropolitan regions? The union, the federal government, because the state government and municipalities just can't do that, don't have resources. So the union, the federal government, uh, carries on, uh, carry on with financing our infrastructure, urban social infrastructure in Brazil. Uh, I know how you hate typologies, I'm sorry. Uh, this is a, uh, after studying these 15 metropolitan regions, uh, we, we have a feeling that a tentative typology must be uh, work as a hy hypothesis in our project. There are some cooperative public functions. Uh, when you're looking to metropolitan governance, uh, we realize that we must look to specific uh, m uh, public functions of common interest. This big governance, metropolitan governance words, it, it, it is too big. But if you look to specific public functions, you may understand a bit better how things work in this fragmented world. Uh, there are some cooperative public functions and some non-cooperative, less cooperative, we're not quite sure about it. Uh, but this is our experience. Uh, I won't explain everything. I will leave this presentation with you. <laughs> uh, going to the end, I hope. Uh, transport is uh, a cooperative public function. It works very well, sanitation too. Uh, health and education, although they are quite cooperative, since they have a social basis and delivering these social services in the local level, it's easier. Uh, 
there is in Brazil kind of a, a, a structure, a, a national structure, national systems, and there is not a much, not much more thing to do, not much space to cooperate in because it's a federal structure, a system uh, like we have in, in health. There is a unified system. Uh, and housing and land use control, uh, it's quite a challenge. How to make municipalities and states cooperate? Uh, there are some new possibilities for metropolitan governance, uh, a new consortial federal law uh, that allows formal cooperation between federative entities. Uh, there are national sector systems, uh, as I said before, with financing and so on. We have good experiences in metro, uh, Recife metro region regarding transport. They have a consortium there. Uh, in Goiana metropolitan region, uh, we also have some experiences in environmental area uh, and transport and uh, so on. And we have different uh, experience from this consortial law. And and there is also the PPPs, the, 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 the triple Ps. Sao Paulo has a, a metro line uh, entirely public sector financed. The union gave the money. Uh, and the PPP was made only to operate the lines after constructing. So the, the big investment is public. Uh, the PPP was uh, designed just to operate the system. So there is some kind of division uh, of work in this PPP. Uh, here we, we have a map with uh, different uh, intermunicipal organizations in metropolitan region of Sao Paulo, Sao Paulo metro region. As you can see, uh, there is a lot of experiences. Uh, and one big, uh, huge difficulty we are having is since the federal government is uh, responding for uh, the biggest part of the investment in urban infrastructure since 2003, uh, there is a, almost a non-comparative public functions and the federal government is enforcing it. It's making the cooperation less possible. Uh, the, the housing program, Minha Casa, Minha Vida, which is my house, my life, we are very creating, okay. We are very creative when uh, naming these programs in Brazil. Uh, is an ex example of a, a good program that is facing uh, 7 million houses uh, debt in Brazil. And these 7 million houses is being constructed, uh, there is a plan to 2023, has been constructed by federal government. But it brings a lot of problems to the municipalities, uh, especially going against the master plans. And there's nothing the mayors can do because the entrepreneur came and say, oh, I have land this way in the fringe of the city. Uh, you put the infrastructure there. Uh, I put the house, you put the infrastructure. So the last one being provocative. Uh, we are talking about uh, metropolitan governance, dealing with horizontal and vertical conflicts and tensions, specific political agendas, historical and cultural differences. Uh, so there is not a, a, a pudding recipe that you take the ingredients and put them all together. Uh, no, it must be seen case by case, considering cultural, political uh, agendas and, and so on. Recognizing the differences between management and governance. And institutional design is not enough. Uh, of course, it is important. But what we see, it's not enough uh, to carry on or, or solve our problems. And it's better when designed specifically for a public function of common interest. So what we are uh, maybe bringing is this advice, uh, look for the public functions case by case, individually. Of course, without losing the connections and influence in terms of the metropolitan level, uh, you must see the case and see the interactions. And taking advantage of other forms of cooperation, including PPP, experimenting and trying at the same time, and to balance the regulation principles of state, market, and community. 
metropolitan region is not about market. Uh, it's market, of course, but it's also a state and community. Uh, sorry, I, I, I took a lot of time. Thank you very much. Sorry. Our, our next speaker is Phil Harrison. Um, with fascination to presentations on this uh, wonderfully complex country and the wonderfully complex cities in India and of course the complex cities in other parts of the world and of course I do speak with some trepidation as I'm not sure what South Africa's particular experience uh, says to your challenges um, but I am comforted by the opening comments that we hear to console each other. Now. South Africa went through radical political transformations and that provided a rare moment for our country. But even so, the change that happened was complex. They the change required an extended transition period and often had ambiguous outcomes. So the key lesson, before I get into the presentation, just to put it up front, if I could venture a key lesson, it's that getting institutions right is necessary, but really far from sufficient. To some extent in South Africa, we got the institutions right, especially in the metropolitan areas, as I will show you. And this brought real benefits, but we made mistakes in the process. And in the rush to transform, for example, we ran down the, the capacity of the state we allowed networks of patronage to flourish within the state. We appointed those we shouldn't, overly politicized the bureaucracy. And so we are currently, despite the fact that there's been radical institutional change, we're currently facing a situation where there's a real crisis of legitimacy in uh, many local authorities. Now, in terms of institutional transformations, they have been radical. If you look at your left, that's what pertained in terms of regional government before 1994. We had four provinces, which were really extension of, of central government. Um, and then we had this extraordinary patchwork of what we call homelands. Every black ethnic group was confined politically to a particular homeland, and some of these homelands were even granted independence by the South African government. Of course, South Africa was the only country to formally recognize their independence. So you had this jigsaw puzzle. And over a number of years, that had to be transformed. In fact, it had to be transformed very quickly after 1994 to what you see on, on your right-hand side, the nine provinces within what we call, well, what I'm calling a quasi-federal arrangement. You had to integrate the administrations of the previous provinces and the administrations of those old homelands into the nine provinces. So South Africa's post-apartheid constitution, post-1994, wasn't the result of sitting down in a technocratic fashion and designing the ideal institutional architecture. In fact, it was a negotiated compromise. The ANC, the strongest political party, expected to win power nationally, and so it argued in its interests for a centralized, unitary state. Other parties, which expected to win power within particular regions, argued for a federal arrangement. So what emerged really was something that's quasi-federal, that's something between, I think, something between Canada and India. And both Canada and India provided important informant models when South Africa's constitution makers were writing the document. What the 1996 national constitution does, it provides for three separately elected spheres of government. Specifically, spheres of government, I'll show you, not tiers of government. And they're described as being distinctive 
but inter interdependent and interrelated. So the municipal sphere is protected in the Constitution. No one can take away the powers of the municipal sphere. It's not dependent on provincial government, for example, for its powers. So you can see in this arrangement, there are definitely elements of federalism, but South Africa very carefully, or the ruling party in South Africa has very carefully avoided using the term federalism and certainly sees the conferring of power on the provinces as a compromise and the outcome of the negotiations and not the ideal. Now, there's, there's the theory and there's the practice. And the Constitution talks about relationships of equality and partnership between the spheres. So in the Constitution, local government is not inferior to provincial government or even to national government. But in practice, of course, the more of a hierarchy actually pertains. And in practice, national government uh, often does have a paternalistic relationship to provinces and provinces to municipalities. So on the left-hand side is the theory. Distinctive spheres of government with some overlapping functions, concurrent functions, as in the Brazilian constitution. Um, and on the right-hand side is what often pertains, but in reality, it's somewhere between the two. And in reality, it's quite a complex arrangement requiring a lot of negotiation between the spheres. There's a recent study that draws a comparison um, between India and South Africa, suggesting that at the time of the creation of the state of India and the state of South Africa, much more recently, there was a similar concern, and obviously a concern with avoiding deepening conflicts in a divided society. And because of this, and this overriding imperative for national cohesion and national unity, um, in both instances, central government was given a fairly strong hand over time. Of course, I don't understand the context well enough, but over time, says the study, India has decentralized, become more truly federal over time perhaps in, in, in a fairly elaborate and sometimes confusing process, um, roles have begun to be clarified. But it's not clear whether South Africa, post-apartheid South Africa, much younger state, will follow this route. Um, because in South Africa already, there's a high level of disenchantment, particularly with provincial governments. And so it's not certain that provincial governments will eventually strengthen their role and function and become what might look like federal states. And the ruling party faced with opposition in some of the regions is frustrated by its lack of ability to exercise full control over the whole country. So there is a very complex set of relationships between the three spheres. And it requires a fairly high level of capacity to manage those complex relationships. Um, and the new state that post apartheid South Africa is often doesn't have the capacity to manage those relationships, leading to some degree of, of dysfunctionality and leading to a decline in public trust uh, towards public institutions. There are a number of current reviews of the system 18 years into the new system. We're asking the question, does the system of multi level governments really enhance democracy? Does it improve or undermine capacity? Does it manage or exacerbate regional and ethnic conflicts? And there is, as I said, a fairly high degree of skepticism about the model. Um, but there's also a lot of caution about major overhauls so recent um, in, in, into the process, only 18 years into the process. And so what we're likely to see are incremental reforms, reforms that would clarify functions, build capabilities rather than another radical overview. In relation to the metros that I'll talk about in more detail, the idea is to give a more coherent set of powers to the metro. At the moment, for instance, transportation is not really a function of the metros, but land use planning is. And so to bring all functions relating to the built environment into the sphere of metropolitan government. Okay, very, very quickly, in terms of local government, there was a transition period. We had 
very highly fragmented, racially structured local authorities, around 1,100 across the country, and they were amalgamated in a five-year period into 284 non-racial municipalities. Of course, not only was it about amalgamation, it was also about democratization, because of course it wasn't a democratic system. And what emerged, of imp which is um, important for this discussion, what emerged from that process really was single-tier metropolitan governance. So for the rest of the country outside the metropoles, we've got two-tier uh, local authorities. But within metropolitan areas, within city regions, we have single-tier uh, metropolitan councils that don't share power with any other local council. And what is important, whereas perhaps in Brazil, metropolitan governments was linked to, to, to the authoritarian regime before 1988, in South Africa, the creation of metropolitan governance was seen as, as linked to liberation, was the outcome of a political struggle, grassroots political struggle, and the clarion call was for one city, one tax base, which would allow for redistribution between wealthy and mainly white areas and poor and mainly black areas. And so metropolitan governance really was welcomed in the country. So we have a system of wall-to-wall -wall municipalities. This just shows local metropolitan municipalities. That little insert at the top shows the metropolitan uh, municipalities. It also shows the political arrangement. It shows the green is the, is the African National Congress, where it's in control of municipalities. The blue is the Democratic Alliance. And showing, for example, why a party like the DA would want a federal solution, as it's, it can capture power within a particular region. The assignment of government functions are quite complex um, because many of the functions, don't worry about the detail here, many of the functions are concurrent, they're shared across the spheres of government and that requires complex negotiations in terms of ha handling any, of any particular function. Uh, fiscal arrangements, subnational government does account for quite a high percentage of state expenditure with provincial government being almost entirely dependent on national government for transfers, education and health is the big, are the big education functions. And local government varies in, 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 the, in the cities, in the metros, um, local authorities are mainly self-funded and in that sense are more aut autonomous and stronger than provincial governments. Um, without the details, there's quite an elaborate framework we can talk about which tries to make the connections across the spheres and there have been some reforms to that system. Many of the reforms simply come from the high courts incrementally resolving areas of ambiguity but there they, they are new approaches now to try and achieve those better connections across the spheres of government. We can talk about that later if you wish. Uh, just in terms of planning, because there's no hierarchy in the system and different spheres of government prepare their own plans, those plans have to be mutually adjusted. So province cannot tell a municipality what should be in a plan um, and, and vice versa. And so the, 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 the difficulty of tying up the planning system without a hierarchy is, is quite a challenge. But let me move quickly on to a big city government particularly metropolitan government, with a focus on what we call the Gauteng city region, which consists of three metropolitan areas, the city of Johannesburg, which is a metropolitan council, the city of Chuan, which used to be called Pretoria, and the city of Ikuruleni, which used to be known as the East Rand. This is a diagrammatic representation of the space economy of South Africa, and you will see towards the top right, that's the Gauteng city region, accounting for 34% of the national economy. And so it's quite a high level of primacy within the country with the coastal city regions uh, accounting for most of the rest of the economy. And so it's, the, the major urban areas in South Africa account for 85% of the GDP, with single city region Gauteng accounting for 34% of the GDP. A GDP. So Gauteng's share of the national economy is similar, for instance, to Stockholm's share of, of Sweden's national economy. And that just shows the settlement distribution and also a fairly high level of primacy, about 22% of the, 
within of the population within the Gauteng city region. Um, it's a region built on gold, and of course we have a lot of challenges, similar I think, and I don't know enough about it, to Mumbai's story in relation to the mills and the vacant land. The mill land is similar perhaps to the mining land we have in, in Johannesburg. So we have a region, the Gauteng city region, of about 12.2 uh, million, which is about half, I guess, of the population of the Mumbai region, similar to the population of, of Mumbai city. Um, of course, huge challenges, fairly rapid increase in population, high unemployment rates, one of the highest in the world. Our Gini coefficient is the highest in the world for any city, 0.73. The international alert level, I'm told, is 0.4. So it's an extremely unequal city. It's a very complex city in its uh, city region, in its spatial structure, largely a legacy of apartheid. Um, it's, it's not a simple gradient profile. The international gradient profile of high densities near the center um, reducing towards the periphery. That's not the case in the city region. Historically, densities were the lowest near the center and the highest on the periphery where the black population was, was often removed to. And so this presents enormous challenges. Just think of the transportation system, trying to connect these fragmented points of density across areas of very low density. Uh, and, and one of our biggest challenges in the city region is, is mobility, just moving people and goods around the city region. Um, this is a, a rather out of date urban age um, diagram, but it shows the Gauteng city region at the bottom right. In comparison, the population figures are out of date, but in comparison with some other city regions with similar population size in the world. So the bottom right is the Gauteng city region. The top left then is London, Paris, and, and uh, Jakarta. Um, and it shows the fragmentation and the low density across much of the city region um, in relation to those, those other regions. So institutionally speaking, the city region is managed like this. There's a provincial government, um, mainly dealing with health and education, but with some overlapping functions with the municipalities. There are three metropolitan municipalities that don't share power. So J there in the center is Johannesburg. It's got about 4.2 mi million people. It's a metropolitan city with a single administration. Ears Ikuruleni. Chwane, it looks very large. In fact, it has the largest municipal area of any city in the world. Its population is less than 3 million. And that's because, the, for political reasons, they've incorporated a semi-rural district into, into Chwane, um, which I won't go into. And then around the edges of those metropolitan areas, you have a two-tier system uh, of district municipalities. The yellow is a district municipality sharing power with three uh, local municipality. So although the system is relatively simple in international terms, it is nevertheless complex and institutional coordination across the boundaries and between province and, and the municipalities where the metropolitan or district is still a challenge. And there are areas of tension. So one of the areas of tension, for example, is, is in the field of housing. So the Constitution says, if a municipality has the capability to handle the housing function, you must devolve the housing function from provincial to municipal, to the municipal sphere. The problem is provincial governments don't want to let go of the housing function. It gives them power. And so there's been a bitter struggle between municipalities like the Johannesburg Metropolitan Council and the Gauteng provincial government around the housing function. In terms of land use management, the Constitution is ambiguous. The writers of the Constitution couldn't foresee every question of interpretation. So there's no function that in the Constitution that says land use management. There's simply a function that says local planning, another function that says regional development, another one that, that says urban development. And so questions of interpretation are really very difficult. So provincial government has interpreted the Constitution to mean that they can undertake as a provincial government, land use management. But the city interprets the constitution to mean that land use management is a municipal function. And so what has happened is that you've had two parallel functions, two parallel systems, 
one managed by provincial, one managed by municipal. Because of this, and developers, of course, play the system. If they think they can get a permission easily through provincial government, they'll go provincial government or they'll go municipal government. And it makes, it makes coordinated planning really difficult. And this led to a lengthy court battle that went right up to the constitutional court, the highest court in the land, which eventually decided that land use management should be at the, within the municipal sphere. So that's clarified the matter. But it was a long and difficult battle. Transport functions are highly fragmented. You can't put together an integrated transport system within our cities because transport functions are divided between national government, provincial government, and local government, and that remains the case and remains one of our big challenges. As I said, mobility is perhaps our biggest challenge in terms of spatial development in the city, and the institutional arrangements don't make it easier to resolve. Uh, national government doesn't like the fact that municipalities have their own, not all municipalities, metropolitan municipalities have their own police force, and there's been a lot of tension within that area of safety and security, and it's an important area for us. We live in a very high crime-ridden city. Um, and so that's another example of, of where ambiguity in the Constitution is leading to difficulties on the ground. So there is an idea, there's a discourse within South Africa, particularly within Gauteng, that comes partly from the Randstad. That's the idea of city region governance. We have three metropolitan councils. Um, how do they relate to each other? And so the idea is to conceive of Gauteng as a city region in the same way as the Randstad was conceived in the Netherlands. Region governance should be provincial government taking over the power of the municipalities and becoming the super municipality. The municipalities, metropolitan municipalities, don't like that, obviously, and talk about voluntary cooperation between the three metropolitan um, municipalities. So where do we go? Do we simplify further? Do we look at a new overarching metropolitan authority, perhaps with a special relationship with national government that bypasses provincial government? That's a possibility. Do we really look at, at the models in the USA? We heard about that yesterday around voluntary collaboration and networking or in the Netherlands or in terms of the concordates between municipalities that you see in the UK, for example. And the interests, obviously, behind this are very different. Or do you, or should we be more cautious and look really at a gradual further simplification of arrangements, extending our metropolitan boundaries or perhaps just project-based uh, collaboration around transport networks? As I've said before, there really is a lack of will to explore the more radical possibilities. We've been through extensive institutional restructuring. We know that that institutional restructuring is insufficient. We still have a fairly complex arrangement because of the nature of our constitution. Um, so the idea is really, and where there seems to be consensus, is what we call a light approach to integration. That's simplifying the institutional terrain without major reorganization. And a lot of that might simply be clarifying powers and functions, which, as I said, are currently ambiguous. And then incrementally building those strategic cross-border partnerships, particularly in terms of transport, but also in terms of other areas. And then aligning our spatial frameworks and planning systems, and this is, is beginning to happen. Um, I'm almost at the end of the presentation, but I thought I should just say something about the internal structuring of a metropolitan area. So the city of Johannesburg, which is one of the three metropolitan areas within the Gauteng city region, is also fairly large. It's got 4.2 million people. It's fairly difficult to administer that without any local councils. So what the city has done is that it's, it's divided itself into seven administrative units we call regions. The terminology gets confusing. And they're not elected. There's just one elected municipal metropolitan council. So there, there are these administrative units. And when the metropolitan city was set up in 2000, these administrative units were fairly powerful, and they performed functions, the, the, the limited uh, housing and health functions that were allocated to municipalities, health and recreation, and so forth. 
Um, but they were seen as too powerful by the elected officials. And so they were significantly downgraded in 2006 and now only perform a very small range of functions and are fairly weak structures. But very recently, about a year ago, they were seen as so weak that they were ineffective. And now they've been enhanced again and strengthened again. So one tends to vacillate between strong internal regions and weak regions. Um, and that has to do with threats to the center. Um, but it is a way of, of, of managing fairly complex um, metropolitan regions. Internally, you have a fairly strong center responsible for policy, strategic planning, some of the core functions. But you, we also have city-owned company, companies, uh, corporatized entities. They're not privatized entities. They're wholly owned by the city that provide for a service delivery. And we've got about 15 of those, the main ones dealing with water, power, and refuse removal. And it's the only city in South Africa that has these corporatized entities. Um, and corporatization did help stabilize a very precarious financial situation. Johannesburg faced near bankruptcy in the late 90s. Um, but have also added problems of institutional coordination because we do, of course, have the CEO for the city um, who has a lot of power together with the executive mayor, non-elected executive mayor, but elected by the elected Metropolitan Council. And so there is a fairly strong center. But by creating corporatized entities, we have created another issue of coordination. Although the city appoints the boards, they can't directly instruct the companies. And so there is a degree of oversight and so there is a debate within Johannesburg as to whether we should have gone the corporatization route. And the response so far has not been to uh, reincorporate these entities into the city administration, but rather to strengthen political and administrative oversight of, of these companies. So, uh, very quickly, some conclusions. The key question that we face currently or a key question is how do we handle those intergovernmental relations in a fairly complex constitutional framework that does not formally allow for hierarchical flows and directives. Of course, some of those do happen. The, the other question is now, 18 years after our initial experiment, we know what the flaws are. Uh, should we now restructure again? As I've said, there's little appetite for that. And then going back to the point I made at the beginning, Institutional structures, institutional architecture does matter, but there are some things that are more important than the institutional um, structure. And so issues around capability, uh, corruption, patronage, and so on, actually have a greater effect on performance of, of institutions than does the institutional architecture. Um, and so the pragmatic approach that is currently being followed, of course, there was a great institutional upheaval um, but now it's about systematically re further reducing the complexity and the system, delineating roles, uh, gradually establishing those voluntary networks of collaboration, which may be a step towards another long-term restructuring and strengthening coherence in the system without negating the benefits of, I'll be careful with, of the term federalism, perhaps quasi-federalism. The benefit of our constitution is that it does force negotiation um, and that is a benefit and then really, very importantly, we need to build the capacity, the capability for those intergovernmental uh, engagements. And let me leave it there. Thank you. Thank you, Phil. Uh, thank you to both of our speakers. I, I think you've both helped us disabuse ourselves of the notion that maybe only India is complex. Um, there's obviously extraordinary complexity to the Brazilian and South African cases. And I think there's a tremendous amount of learning that can take place by thinking comparatively through these cases. I think many of the challenges that you've identified in Brazil and South Africa are quite similar to the challenges faced in India. And we'll be taking up uh, some of these comparative themes throughout the afternoon. Unfortunately, we got a bit of a late start this morning and we are on a very, very tight schedule. It's imperative we start the next session at 11.30. 
and I think uh, everyone would be quite angry at me if I deprived them of their tea and coffee. So I want to make sure we have time for tea and coffee, but that we start at 11.30, right? Because we have no, no room for extra time um, extending the session. So what I'd like to say, I mean, I'm, I'm going to start by taking myself out of uh, providing any commentary and um, might make some contributions later this afternoon. But I ask that our three panelists, and I do apologize, uh, keep their comments as short as possible. And we might even um, um, uh, defer uh, your responses to this afternoon where we have two more open sessions that will allow us to think through these com comparisons a little bit more. So with that, with a last plea that we try to keep this as succinct as possible, I'll hand things over to Mr. Ravindra. Thank you. I think, uh, yeah, I am happy that other countries share our conflicts and tensions. And I would also say that, like uh, maybe South Africa, India is not a purely federal state, but it is quasi-federal in character. We have a centralist state list and a concurrent list. But more often than not, that the central government tries to prevail. And in the Constitution, we do not have the expression metropolitan region. Although more than one million population cities are called metropolitan cities, and we have made provision for a metropolitan planning committee and a metropolitan development plan, metropolitan region as such is a new concept, even in India. And uh, let me say something about, in view of the shortage of time, of the Bangalore governance system, since I come from Bangalore, and yesterday somebody was saying that uh, most of the discussion seems to veer around Mumbai or Delhi, and the other cities are hardly mentioned. <clears throat> and Bangalore is peculiar in the sense we have two metropolitan development authorities. It's, it's a, one is the Bangalore Development Authority, which, co which covers what is called the Bangalore planning or metropolitan area, which is just about 1,300 square kilometers. But the Bangalore metropolitan region is 8,000 square kilometers and covers the entire earlier district of Bangalore, which is, <coughs> so we have about nine municipalities in the Bangalore uh, metropolitan region. Well, we have the similar problems of institutional fragmentation, coordination, and, and so on. But I would like to draw attention to the fact that, you know, the forces that are operating in a metropolitan city or a metropolitan region, I think we need to take note of that. Why does a city sprawl into a metropolis, metropolitan city, and then a metropolitan region? Basically, I think I would say the most critical is the factor of land. The land market is the most important force that is operating in India. See, it may be the real estate, it may be the industry. See, these locations are divided by the industrialists or the developers. And then the state comes into play and starts planning. In a way, you know, development by the private developers overtakes planning by the uh, state or state government. But let me also say at this stage that uh, so far as the development, infrastructure development, which is perhaps the most important that we talk about these days. The central government tries to, again, exercise control over the state governments through its own projects, like in South Africa, they were saying, or in Brazil. You know, it can be cooperative, federalism, or whatever, whatever the expression that is used. Now we have the JNNURM, for instance, the Orlal Nehru Renewal Mission, or the Ray or earlier IDSMT, even in the rural areas, MNR, IGS, they are all through financing, through funding and projects. The central government is able to exercise control over the state governments. And state governments in turn exercise control over the city government, whether they are a metropolitan region or a city. So it is for the state government to decide what sort of a metropolitan region they want to set up. And it is. Uh, <coughs> It is the, for instance, now in, uh, in Bangalore, we have decided, I mean, the state government has recently taken a decision. In order to decongest the city, Bangalore city by itself becomes, you know, is becoming more and more congested. So we will set up 
eight different city clusters within the metropolitan region. That is the uh, industrial clusters or city clusters. So that way you provide also proper connectivity. Ultimately, next to land is transportation. You provide connectivity to these regions. And then you know, to that extent, maybe you are able to plan better the development of the metropolitan region. <coughs> but the, so far as the gom gom metropolitan structure is concerned, we have a Bangalore Metropolitan Region Development Authority, as I said, and a Bangalore Development Authority. <coughs> What I would suggest is that certainly we need a single authority for the purpose of planning, capital budgeting, and coordination. So the two-tier structure should be that you know the municipalities can smaller, can be smaller. In fact, uh, Delhi has now the Delhi Corporation has split into three municipal corporations. In Bangalore also, we have now floated the idea. You know, suddenly an area of municipal area of 235 square kilometers became 800 square kilometers. And now they find it unmanageable. So recently we had a seminar to say, or to raise the question, whether we can have smaller municipalities. So for, for providing local services, I think smaller municipal organizations are better. And for the purpose of coordination, infrastructure development, it would be better to have a larger authority. Now, whether it should be a metropolitan planning committee as provided for in the Constitution or a metropolitan planning and development authority, which perhaps even the CPR report in a way seems to suggest, or it should be a kind of a city-state. I think yesterday somebody was mentioning that if at all you want to have a proper leadership, and we are speaking about the mayoral type of government, you know, whether a strong mayor, political leadership is certainly extremely important. What our cities lack today is political leadership. Unlike a chief minister in a state and the prime minister of the country, if we ask the question, who is the leader of the city, there is no single answer. Is it the mayor, the commissioner, or perhaps the chief minister himself, as some people would say. So the, if you want a chief minister-like power structure at the metropolitan level, maybe a metropolitan region could also be a metropolitan state, if at all. But the region should be large enough. But whether the state governments would go in for such an arrangement is a moot point. You know, whether the state, the chief minister himself doesn't let go of the powers. <laughs> this, this is the crucial question. So I would say, in, in conclusion, that any kind of changes that we are now contemplating would certainly need an amendment to the 74th Constitution Amendment itself, what I have been you know, propagating or suggesting all along. Unless you think of a thorough overall of the 74th Constitution Amendment, we will not be able to put in place a proper or appropriate structures both at the city and the metropolitan level. So role delineation, I mean the delineation of metropolitan area, which was discussed for long yesterday, would also mean an amendment to the 74th constitutional amendment. I think uh, that is the final message that I would like to leave at the moment. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Um, since the time is short, I, I would li like to raise certain issues which have come out from yesterday's and today's discussion, and also which, is, which are the points which are for consideration of the CPR team uh, for taking this dialogue further. You know, since yesterday, I think there is uh, been, when metropolitan planning and governance has been discussed, I think it's assumed, and I, we, at all international case studies present us this policy framework of neoliberal paradigm. And I think there is very little uh, connection between the issues of governance and po development policy paradigm that's been, uh, I think today's individual country case studies have brought that out better, and I think that is 
a need of the CPR study to locate the whole discourse on regional development and metropolitan regional development within the policy discourses that we had. For example, in India, we had earlier a policy discourse of balanced regional development built on the equity and the principles of into inverted comma socialism. Uh, from there, we are moving into more economic growth paradigm. And that's when this idea of regional entities or regional governance emerges. And I think we need to uh, look at uh, this whole linkages between the development paradigm and governance paradigm that one is talking about. And especially in the Indian case, explore it more. With a little more historical trajectories, I think these two case studies today, given the situation that the countries have gone through in political terms, the one coming from the apartheid regime and other from the dictatorial regime, they are clear cut uh, dates and periods when these transitions occur. And so uh, that needs to be seen. Second, in India, we also have states which have a very different development trajectories. And so a metropolitan region within Mumbai could be a different political trajectory compared to Delhi. And I think this little more disaggregated analysis of historical trajectories of metropolitan regions also need to be done. Second, I think uh, we've been assuming uh, urban governance, urban areas, and it's been stated even in the JNNURM uh, preamble that urban areas are centers of economic growth. I think that's tautological. Uh, historically, it's tautological. I, I mean, I, it's trying to push for a certain kind of paradigm shift. Uh, what is not talked about is that urban areas, and including metropolitan regions, are also habitats. Uh, of people and think that the entire policy discussion since yesterday uh, does not bring out these nuances of how one would look at an urban area as an habitat versus a growth center. Uh, as a result, I think this complexity is of, in Brazilian case, he very nicely put it as proper definition of public functions that gets missed out. I think we need to have this discussion on India that when we talk about uh, governance issues, decentralization, etc. Are we also looking at cities that have habitats and what does it mean? Imply in terms of policy and governance issues, including setting up of institutional case systems that we have. I think Mr. Ravindran said very nicely what I think we also need to have distinction in Indian discourse on differences between authority and the government. And uh, Unfortunately, I think a lot of, I think Shiv Ramakrishnan's own studies earlier have shown and he's been uh, showing his uh, uh, discontentment with lack of implementation of 74th Amendment itself because cities don't have powers today. And the entire game of implementation of JNNURM projects, including the infrastructure projects, including housing projects, uh, which is, I think, of ministers interests. There is a lot of centralization of way things are happening, but states are not listening because what we find is fairly high. Uh, uh, in last 10, 15 years, we do find states em emerging as an entities, which are powerful entities than the national government. And there's already a big tension between the states and the central government. And we do see that getting played out in the implementation of JNNURM. And especially uh, JNU and, and RM, the BSUP, the housing component, there's much, much more tension because, for example, Rajiv Awas Yojana comes up with an idea of in situ redevelopment, which gets translated in practice in the state as a real estate project of affordable housing. And uh, it's not necessarily that both are the same because one does find that when the housing is addressed through uh, only FSI and affordable housing projects. There's a lot of gentrification and displacement of the poor population that we see in various cities. Uh, the BSUP housing itself has shown that the low income groups, about bottom 40%, that is what I think our understanding is in various cities, they get do, do not become part of such programs. And with increasing urbanization, if India's growth has to be retained, there has to be urbanization to bring in labor in the cities. And if the labor in the cities have to be in, the approach to urbanization and housing through FSI and the definition of affordable housing is not going to give us answers that we are looking for. 
So there is this warning. So in that case, uh, what I like these two case studies today is presented, give us this detailed, in-depth analysis of central, state, and local government uh, relationships. I think that we need to explore more in various studies that we have. Uh, last thing that I do want to ask a question to the South African speaker, Philip. You did mention about what is the share of uh, subnational governments in terms of their expenditures, but I think Ivan would like to know more about their, uh, maybe not now, but in the T, is how much is their tax collection, because that's where the vertical imbalance in terms of decentralization can be seen in India. Uh, between, well, it's a, par a paradox in India. The states want more authority, but states don't want to decentralize authorities to lower levels of government. And we really are out of time, but it will help take your comments very quickly. And then I would ask everyone to please get your coffee and tea and return immediately so that we can begin the next session. Okay, I, as I'm going to be the last, I will also speak the least. Um, I'm not a planner, and today we've had a, a bird's eye view. My job as a journalist has often been to get the worm's eye view of what goes on in cities. So I think there are some questions that I would like to present, which I think should remain also centered when we are talking about institutional changes which certainly need to take place. But I think we have to ask, who is it for? What are we making these institutional changes for? And I would suggest that quite often in the language of planning and discussion, the person right at the bottom of the heap is forgotten. And in India, certainly, since December 16th and that horrific gang rape that took place in Delhi, the issue of cities and public spaces and safety of the most vulnerable has become central to the discussion of, of urbanization. So I think we must keep that in account, that cities are people, and I think you mentioned this, that I think somehow the people element uh, seems to be forgotten. And therefore, I think also in terms of what are the priorities, both in terms of institutional change and investment, tend to get sidelined into either economic growth or profitability of, of cities and institutions that run it, rather than making cities livable, again, for the people who are the most vulnerable, who are at the bottom of the heap. And therefore, you know, priorities such as public transport, priorities such as sanitation, which is very much a women's issue, uh, priorities such as affordable housing, these are not priorities. We can see this, I am a resident of Mumbai, and this is a city that is totally dysfunctional because the priorities have been dictated entirely by the interests of eight to 10% of the people who live in this city and not the 90% of the people who live here. So, and the other thing I would say is the common wisdom in India over the last 65 years has been that the more you decentralize, the more you give power to people, <coughs> you actually create efficiencies of another order, not of the type that the corporate world talks about, but efficiencies because you actually <coughs> deliver services to the people. So I think any counter trend that leads to centralization of, the pow of power uh, in institution building is uh, dysfunctional, especially in the Indian context. I cannot speak of any other context. And the last thing I'd like to say is, in all our countries now, we have an informed citizenry. It doesn't matter what class they belong to. Because of right to information, because of the spread of information, people are aware. They're asking questions. They want to know. So it has to be, again, regardless of the institutions, built into, it has to be a responsive system of governance. A system of governance where the distance between the governed and those who govern is reduced. And I think if you build that into the discussions on the structures that we require, then you will have something that will actually work on the ground. Otherwise, it will remain in the realm of discussion and reports and studies and not necessarily make the life of the ordinary urban citizen any better. Thank you very much. Marco and Phil, thank you very much for your extraordinary presentations. Um, I'm, I apologize again for uh, short-circuiting the discussion. And to the panelists for raising so many fascinating questions, which I think are almost perfect segues into our next session, which will be taking up the political space in which institutional reforms might take place. And then this afternoon, we'll have occasion to revisit and I hope interrogate all of the questions that you've raised and discuss South Africa and Brazil through Indian lenses uh, a little bit more. So again, thank you very much.